certain judgments that is already spoken by God, that is already established. And so once we choose to take certain path, we activate those judgments against our lives. We're warned that we shouldn't take away anything from his word and we shouldn't add anything to his word. In the law in the book of Deuteronomy, the children of Israel were warned where that was concerned. In the book of Revelation, Jesus warned the churches and he said, if you had to the word, the plagues that are written in this book will be added to you. Have you ever wondered why so many sickness in, is in the church? People who say they love God, people who claim that they are of God and, you know, they're God's people, man of God, woman of God, man of faith, and all of these things. And there's so many sickness, which it should not be. Because when you think of Israel under the Old Testament, the only time sickness and disease touched them was when they disobey God. When they disobey God. Not asking you, it's established. And we see the times when certain plague came among them was because of their rebellion against God. So they breached the covenant and God had already told them that if they did that, this is what would have happened. So I'm saying all of that to say this, that for me, I can't stop you, can't stop those of you that are coming in this room, and I, I tremble, you know, when I come to stand in front of these people, and many of them have become familiar with me because they think that they know me because they've been around me for 12, 10, 8, 5, 6, a year or so, because, you know, we, we think that because I meet somebody two times, I, am, I know the person, you know, he's my bosom body. You know, we're pal, we, you know, we, 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 we need to wake up and understand what is happening here. What is happening here? I was thinking about it this morning, that before I got born again and came in the church, the church was already messed up. It was already in a great mess. And to think that I've been a part of it now for almost 40 years, and what I've seen over that period of time is that the mess simply increased it has gotten worse and the sad thing is that not many that say they are of God and are a part of the church cares anything about God's plans and purposes for their lives so we continue to submit ourselves to the culture of the world and then you see I am only one I am only one for a lot of you you have never met a preacher like me. You have never met anybody talking like me. And, as, and many of you have become familiar with it. So it's not touching you anymore. It's not causing you to tremble anymore. It's not causing you to want to change anymore because you have gotten used to it. But I warn you, be very careful. We don't have a lot of preachers talking like I am talking. Because if we do, we're going to be targeted. We are... Allowing ourselves to be highlighted and, 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 you know, you become a, um, it, I'm looking for a particular word here, but, but the, the, we, 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 we want, we, we're in it to be, you know, we're, we're in it to be safe and to be comfortable. So it's about comfort and convenience. Walking with Christ at no time, anyone that is truly walking with Christ, there's no comfort and convenience for you in this world. Jesus Christ says in John chapter 16, in this world you will have tribulation. Once you are seriously walking with God, there's no comfort and no convenience and no peace for you out there in this world. Jesus said, if the world persecute me, if it hated me and did what it did to me, then it's also going to persecute you. But he said, I pray the Father that he will preserve you from the evils of the world. So I'm not afraid of the world. I'm not afraid of any government. I'm not afraid of any thing that is around me. I'm not afraid of any system because the God who I know, he is above all and he's able to always 
protect and defend those whom he sent, those whom he is using wherever he chooses to use them. When Moses went to Pharaoh and Pharaoh decided that he's going to stand against God, we saw how that ended. When the three Hebrew boys stood up for their God and Nebuchadnezzar made a decree that is irreversible from a human standpoint, but God reversed it. When Daniel stood up for his God, the king made a decree and it couldn't reverse humanly, but God reversed it. And throughout the scriptures, all the way into the New Testament, we see those examples. I believe it. I must believe it. I must believe it. And over the years since I've given my life to the Lord, the fights start way early. And I understood that it was a clear indication that I'm on the right path. So every time the enemy shows up and come against me, it allows me to go deeper, go higher, draw closer. So today, as we come together in this room, it's... Uh, Unusual time for our meetings. We have two fasting meetings on Saturdays, so I don't think it's too strange for us. But based on the holiday season, it's a holiday. I don't celebrate what the holiday represents, but it's a holiday. And though we come together in this moment, it is not an indication that we're celebrating it. We're not here to celebrate Christmas Eve or to celebrate Christmas. And for the next Saturday that we'll come together, it will be New Year's Eve. We're not here to watch for any New Year coming in. It didn't come from God. It starts with the slaves in the United States. Because that thing originated in the United States. And it took years before it, it ventured to other parts of the world. Do you know that there was a time that Canada never celebrated Christmas? Did you know that there was a time when the United States didn't celebrate Christmas? There was a time when Christmas was not celebrated in the Caribbean. The Aboriginal people that was even here before all of that, they didn't know anything about any Christmas, right? So when I talk and you want to come against me as if it is, you know, establishing heaven and it's written in the word of God, there is nothing of God or the scripture to support this pagan religion. It comes out of Europe, comes out of Europe. The church adapted it, the, the Roman Catholic Church, Christianized it to bring in the people who were a part of this pagan worship. And the church should have stood against it. The early church never celebrated. But I'm talking about the, the worthless, good for nothing, what we call church today. We have no spine. We have no backbone. We submit to the culture of this world because our source is in this earth, is in this world. And we think that if we do anything to offend them, then our supply is going to be cut off. Our supply is going to be cut off. So I've been tested for years to submit to nastiness and threaten and things hold over my head. That if you don't do this, this... <laughs> and when you threaten me, don't do it, please. Don't do it. Don't do it because you're not going to like it. Because I, I don't do well with threat. And when I say I don't do well, when you threaten me, it stirs me up. <laughs> and so I want us to really understand as we come together today, this is not a play thing. It's not a joke. Um, for some persons who would want to be here today, I know that because of the weather, um, um, for some of you in certain areas, because, you know, of where you are located, certain things happen. And I think they were exaggerating about the storm. I notice anytime the U.S. get anything, Canada wanted to. Because, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Buffalo had about six feet of snow. So Canada said, we, we need to, you know, be a part of the excitement. So they predict and prophesying one of the person was saying this is this is historic <laughs> I said not where I am and then I also found out that Satan was using that to stop us from even coming together today so right away I spoke to it Amen. I spoke to it 
I said in the vicinity of where we are and where we're supposed to function, it will not happen the way that they're saying it. We will only have a normal, regular. Someone called me yesterday to check in on me. So what's happening on your side? I said, nothing much. <laughs> Just normal, you know, not, not much snow, not much wind. And I said, you remember, I'm in the area. So because I'm there, certain things Satan can get away right. in doing. So for those of you that, you know, in certain areas like London and those other places, thank God for this medium that we're able to stream. And I'm glad to see those of you who were able to make it out and to be a part of this. And they're calling for strong wind. And I was thinking even yesterday, I was, I was going to send out a message and say, I'm not going to send it. Because if we're listening to the teaching and getting the teaching, we should know that we have authority to speak to these elements when they show up to interfere with things concerning God in your life. Jesus spoke to the storm. Jesus spoke to the wind and the wave. He spoke to certain things. And because we have a slack church, we think that we're at the mercy of anything that is, you know, coming against us. Oh, you know, how are we going to manage? We have authority in Christ to deal with these elements. Amen? I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please. I think maybe they would have um, put a message out there for those who were connecting via the internet that, you know, we are getting things together so we would start a little late than the time that we had planned for, which was 10. But we're here. We're here. We're going to pray. And... I am going to remind you of something that is very dear to the heart of God. And throughout the, the history of the scriptures, we hear that sound coming through the prophets. We hear that sound coming through his son, Jesus the Christ, when he came in time. And those whom he chose to be apostles, true apostles, the sound continued through them. It's a cry for oneness. Sin brought division where the human is concerned in representing the oneness of God. And even though sin came into the picture and did that, doesn't mean that there is no hope. Because many of us are behaving as if Christ never accomplished what God intended for him to accomplish. Christ took care of the issue of sin. So in him, there is freedom from sin and the effects of it. So I am not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. I was a sinner up until the year 1987. I was 18 years old when I gave my life to the Lord. And after I got born again, I came into a church where they were adamant. They were pushing to convince me that even though I am born again, I am in Christ, I am still a sinner. And when I read the word, and the more I read the word, the more I see the order and the standard of God, I could not accept it. I could not. 
what shall we say then? Romans chapter 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, God forbid. For how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? And with that, I want us to read again Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Can you read it for me, Marlon, from verse 1 to 11? We don't understand when the Bible used the word death. And the word death is used in various ways in the scripture and has several meanings to it. But one of the concepts of death that you and I can relate to, we have seen persons died. We have seen a thing died. We have seen animals died. And when they die, they cease to exist in time and nothing of this world matters to them anymore. And when that death takes place, we see a decay. If a tree dies, over time the tree begins to rot and it, it, it goes to nothing. Right? It ceases to exist. That is the concept that the scripture used for us to understand that when we're in Christ, we're dead to sin. We're dead to sin. It says, it says we should reckon ourselves also dead to sin. And why are we acting like we're idiots? And we're not. Because we can relate to death. We have family members that have passed. They're no longer here. You can't go look for them anymore. You can't give them anything. They can't give you anything. You can't invite them to dinner anymore. You can't go and have dinner with them. You can't meet them at the mall. They're no longer here. So they're dead to this life. They don't need clothes anymore. We're, we come out in the minus 16 feeling like minus 20 something. They're not, they're not concerned. You have to find the necessary clothing to attire yourself to come out. They're not. The cold, even if their body was out there, the, the cold wouldn't bother them. They're dead to everything around them. Why can't we get that and believe God that in Christ there is a power there is an order, there is an authority that is established to completely kill you, kill you, murder you, where sin is concerned, and completely take you away. You, you ever see, and I believe it happened even in real life, but if you're watching some movie and somebody is in a situation where, you know, they have people coming at them and whatever, and they fake their death. And once they fake the death and it goes out there, the person like, guess what? Whoever was hunting them, stop hunting them. Looking for them, they stop looking for them. So even when we think that Satan can just show up and do whatever he wants, it's because of our wavering and our unbelief. When you truly believe, I promise you, there are many times when Satan show up around you and he doesn't see you. They sought. You remember on many occasions the Bible said they sought to lay hands on Jesus and they could not because his hour was not yet come. There was even one point where Jesus literally disappeared. We see the spirit moving Philip, moving Elijah. It's the same spirit that we have today if you're born again. <laughs> Boy, the devil is relentless at coming at me. And I'm going to show him. I'm going to remind him. Because he has, the devil has seen a nasty church around him that he has been using for a long time. I'm going to remind him that there are some people in this earth today that, you, that they will never be your vessel any longer. They are dead to you. And they are alive in Christ. Read, brother. Glory to God. You were raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, 
not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Mm. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleansiness, passion, evil, desire, and covetiveness, which is adultery. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when mm. you lived in them. But now, but now, but now, but now, wow. you yourselves are put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Do not lie to one another. Mm. Do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, mm. circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ, Christ. is all and in all. Wow. But Christ is all. What, what, what does that all mean? What does it look like? Everything that God is, Christ is. Everything that God purposed to show him off in time from heaven to earth because remember the very creation exists out of Christ Christ is the order of the creation the ground you're standing on Christ is the order of it when you sit on the chair Christ is the order of it in him all things exist and is held together it's not because they put screws and put all stuff. Christ is the order of things staying together. <laughs> we don't know Christ and we need to know him. That's why Jesus asked the disciples the question at that juncture because it was very important for them to get that revelation. Who do men say that I the son of man am we read those scriptures and we just read and run on because we think we're just reading a storybook we need to get that revelation who is christ and when they all said this one said this one said this one said he said but who do you say that i am god gave peter god gave because if god doesn't give it to you you can come into it. God gave him the revelation. You are the Christ. The son of the living God. Christ is all. Why are you looking at me strange and funny? It's written, Christ is all. And the all that he is, is in us. All with that all. It's impossible for me not to live righteous. The only way I don't live righteous, I have a rebellious heart and don't want to. Once Christ is in me, it's become 100% possible for me to live righteous, for me to live holy, for me to live holy and perfect. And everything that God now wants from my life, it is possible because of Christ. Because he is the one in whom the Father is well pleased. So when he comes to live in me, God is now well pleased with me. God is well pleased with me. So there is therefore now no condemnation. I'm no longer condemned. I'm no longer under a cloud of guilt anymore. Because Christ changes all of that. 
So as the father saw Christ, now he's seeing me in that same order. But do we believe it? You see what your mind is doing to you? Because many of you have been around me for years and you know the reason why you're no further gone where you're gone? Because every time the Spirit speaks through me, you reason it out. You realize that God and Christ is outside of reason? Nothing that you reason about God will ever get God or anything that God is. God is outside of reasoning. You notice the scripture says, the natural thinking person cannot receive the things of God because they are foolishness. So a lot of us, even though we're walking with God for years, our reasons, our reasoning ability continue to rob us. Because when we hear certain things, if you can't reason it out, you say, well, I, 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 you know, I see past, I, I know, uh, da, 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 but, but I don't reason out anything. I believe it. Thomas wanted to reason out. Unless I see him, touch him, push my finger in his side, I'm not going to believe you, Peter. I'm not going to believe any of you. Because they saw him before. And eight days later, he appeared to them when they, locked, when they were locked away in the room. And when Jesus appeared, remember? Now Thomas is seeing him. Thomas, at that time now from his reasoning, my Lord and my God, Jesus said, it's because you see me. He said, shut your mouth. It's because you see me why you believe. But he said, Thomas, blessed, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. How do, how do I believe without seeing? By his spirit. When I'm born again, there is now that part of me that is capable of accurately relating to God. To others, you're going to also be a fool. Look like a fool. (laughs) And they're going to treat you like a fool. But are you a fool? (laughs) It's your spirit that must relate to what the spirit is saying to you right now. So if your spirit is bearing weakness, shut down your head. I shared with you. We're going to pray. I shared with you. When the Lord brought us together as a group in Jamaica and we started experiencing, because we came together at first thinking that it was just going to be us, you know, doing, praying together, doing, encouraging ourselves and so on. I was talking to a sister a couple of days ago from Jamaica and reminding her of certain things when we came together as a group then. And after a while, People started showing up where we were. We were at a particular sister home that she, uh, she, was, she, was take, she was the caretaker of the property. There was this Jewish family that lived in Kingston, very wealthy family. They have business all over the island and so on. So they have this home in Portland and the, and the, and the beach, close to the beach, steps from the beach. So the sister was the caretaker of the property. I, 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 a lot of acres, and they have this huge house. So we would gather there on a Thursday, praying together, building up each other from different denominations. People started showing up, and guess what? Healing started manifesting. We saw all different types of things begin to manifest. And there was this moment now when we, the, the, the crowd showed up to the point where the house could not contain them any longer. Remember, there was this house in the town of Port Antonio. I remember one Thursday, the room, the the living room, the the veranda was filled with people. And that's when I went to this pastor and asked if we could use their church building because they don't use it in the day. And she said, sure, just give me a a, a couple days. Let me talk to a few other persons. But she said, I'm sure it will be okay. They get back to us and we started doing that. There's this particular Thursday when this young lady showed up having an accident. Car hit her off her bike. Eight places in her pelvic area was broken. They went in and they did an operation. They put the bones together and put eight metal pins. I've never prayed for anybody like that before. Marlon, 
So I remember the day when the young lady came up in front of me and telling me, my head was, was now jumping ahead, trying to, you know, reason out why, don't, don't pray for her, don't do this. And I had to shut it down. And what I keep on assuring myself with, because I know that God is looking for a vessel to manifest himself. I assured myself with this, that nothing is impossible for God. So even though I have never seen it, even though I have never heard of it, it doesn't mean that God can't do it. You have to learn how to quickly shut down your head. A lot of you show up in these meetings and you're not getting much because you're reasoning it out before you're putting it in a bag. Before you put it in your trolley, you're reasoning it out. You don't come here to reason. You come to take whatever the Spirit gives you. You just pack it in, pack it in. And the rest is history. Last time I heard from that young lady, I think she's in the state. When I laid my hands on her, and when the power of God hit her body, and she dropped the crutches, and she ran down the back of the building, the church building, and she came back up, and she went. Two weeks later, when she went and did, went to go and do her visit, because she had to watch this. She had to go through a process where they would do a second operation to remove the metal pins. When she went back two weeks later, she came, brought the x-ray. I showed it to the people. They did 12 x-ray. They had the first one showing the pins that they did because you know that's how they operate, right? The doctor would have an x-ray to show. So they would look at the process and the progress and so on and, and determine if there's any other thing. And they had the first one showing the metal pin and the 12 that they took after that, no metal pin and the bones are perfectly healed. <laughs> Do I care if you want to believe there's somebody that is experiencing the benefits of it? And I have many weaknesses. So after that now, Satan know that he couldn't play with me any longer where that was concerned. Because I had seen the evidence. I'd seen the evidence. So from that point on, I see someone with a broken arm. I am ready. I say, you, you believe that God can, you know, you believe. And, and broken toes and broken ankle and broken whatever. This pastor wife, we were in a conference and she met in an accident. Her arm broke. And while I'm there teaching, the Holy Spirit said, you need to do this. And I'm thinking I need to finish teach. And I stop. And I said, what's happening? And, so, and I laid my hands on her. She took her hand over the thing and she began to move it left, right and center. The only thing is that the cast was still there. She moved. Go and take it off. Yes. Quickly. Doctor says, we're giving you two weeks. God say a second. Because I'm the one that created the body. I created the bone. Doctor have to study to understand the bone. God doesn't study to understand your body. He framed it. Amen. Let us pray. Those that are joining us, come on. Deliver, be delivered from religion. Be delivered. Be delivered from the, the culture of the world and the culture of the present church. Come in to the kingdom of God. Come into the world where nothing is impossible. That's the world we're invited to come and live. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Are you with God? Are you with God? Is God with you? Go ahead and talk to him. Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray in this room. Pray in this room. Pray in this room. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you for this opportunity that we have been given to come together in this moment on this day. What a God you are. You are the eternal God. You are the God who created the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that therein is. No God, no other God could accomplish that. No other God could do that. And that's why throughout the scripture, the scripture continues to highlight that. That you are the God who created the heavens and the earth. All the other gods, they are gods, they're idols. They, they have been manufactured by man's ingenuity. But our God, you are a God that was not created. You're a God that was never formed by the hands of man. You are God and God alone. 
You are God and God alone. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this privilege and this opportunity that we have to come together in this room. And not only in this room, but across the world by way of streaming. Father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Oh, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. May we give room to your kingdom. 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 Spirit of God, I give you freedom, I give you room to speak, to move, and to do what needs to be done in this room. Let your word continue to run swiftly up on earth. Those who hear your word and tremble at your word, you say, Father, that's the one, that's the one that I dwell in. That's the one that I live in. That's the one that I walk in and put myself on display. Father, I pray that the spirit of wisdom and revelation will be given the room to sit upon us, rest upon us, and that the eyes of our understanding will be open. We will see, we will know what is the height, the depth, the width, the breadth. The length of that which you have vested in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you raised him up from the dead. And he was raised up for our glory. And he is the head of the church. Which is his body. We are members of that body. So Father. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This will not be a religious gathering, a religious moment, a religious experience for those that are watching. But they're hearing your word. They're hearing your truth. They're hearing the spirit like never before. And their lives are taking on the order of Christ. Christ is all and in all. Christ is all and in all. And that's why the devil went and put a spirit in play called the spirit of Antichrist. Because he knows that Christ is all that the Father wants. And he's the pattern and he's the standard. And when he's in us, he can stop us. So he puts a spirit in place to resist, to oppose Christ. But when we submit to Christ, that spirit can never overcome us. Little children, you are of God and have already overcome them. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So there is nothing, nothing, absolutely no one or nothing to be afraid of. Even when the impossible is breathing in your face, step back and look at God. Step back and look at God. Is there anything too hard? Is there anything too hard for the living God? So Father, thank you for your spirit that you have given unto us so that we would know the things that are freely given to us. And we reject and renounce the, the messed up church we renounce and reject the traditions of men. We renounce and reject the fallacy of preachers who don't know you. And they think that because they went to Bible college, they are speaking for you. Father, we rebuke it. We expose it. We throw it down. We pull it up. And wherever those false seed has been sown in our lives, Father, we give you freedom by your word and the Holy Spirit to root it out, to pull it out, to root it out, pull it out. And let truth replace it, Father. Let truth replace it. And Father, we're not going to put a person above your word. 
We're not going to be a personality worship. That idolatry has to come down. Father, your word must measure them. And if they don't fit within alignment with your word, we will walk away. We will reject. We will turn them off. Unsubscribe. Because, Father, you told us in your word that if any come not bringing this doctrine, this teaching, this truth, this message of the kingdom, you said that we should not invite them into our homes and we should never bid them Godspeed lest we become partakers with them. Father, thank you for waking up your people, storing up your people, and bringing your people into the light of who Christ is. Thank you, Father, for granting that. Somebody receive that. Christ is all. Christ is all. Christ is all. You've got to meditate on that. Meditate on it. Every time, meditate on it. Stop and look at it. Think about it. Because w w do you understand what that means? And it is for us. Christ is all. It's speaking to us if we have been raised up with him. We're supposed to access that. We're supposed to make withdrawal from that moment by moment and day by day. Christ is all and in us all. Christ is all and in all. My God. My God. My God. Thank you. Thank you for granting that. Amen. Be seated if you can, please. I believe we have a baby to be blessed. Is that baby here yet? You get any news from them? Okay, we're going to move on because I normally want to do that before because I don't know how the, what the Spirit will do. So we'll move on. Let's see. So we started something that we got the information about in the newsletter first. And then I started reminding you of that. So we accomplished the first phase of it. That we came this side to enter the building. <laughs> Hallelujah. When we show up at first this morning, the door was not open yet and the wind... <laughs> Round the corner. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we made it in. So be reminded that is the same process for next Saturday. Um, and next Saturday we will be um, taking the Lord's Supper. And I spoke with somebody in Grenada. Sister Judy is in Grenada. Uh, I think it was on Friday. Or yesterday was Friday, right? So she called and she said, you know, Pastor, I heard what you said about the, 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 the Lord's Supposed. I went and I got my stuff already. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So I want to remind those of you that are watching, wherever you're watching from. And as I said, you don't need to put yourself under any, you know, extra pressure to get any fancy stuff or whatever. 
a regular mug, cup, whatever, and get some juice. It doesn't have to be any fancy juice either. You don't need Welsh grape juice. For some of you where you are, that might be pretty expensive. If you have some grape and can make your own juice, not a problem. Because it's not the thing, but it's what it represents that matters. Okay? And so we're inviting you to be a part of it. There's something that is important to this, where the Lord's Supper is concerned. If, say, five or ten years pass and you never observe the Lord's Supper, it puts you in a position where you start to forget the death of Jesus, why he died, and what was accomplished for you. Because anytime we forget his death, <laughs> we are exposed to certain deception, certain things that the enemy wants to bring in. So that's why he said to the disciples, as often as you eat and drink this cup, you show my death until I come. You do it in remembrance of me. Remembering what? Remembering what? So for some of us, it would have been about maybe two years or so since we did that, or two plus years. So we need to do this. And as I started this teaching, the Holy Spirit you know, brought it in my spirit that we should do this at the ending of this year. Not about the year really, but in light of even the teaching that I'm doing. So please join us and be a part of it. And what I'm going to do for next Saturday, I am not going to focus too much. Of course, I'm not straying because that sits directly in it. But what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to take the time and teach on the Lord's Supper. Because many persons do not have a clear understanding of it. And as a result of that, um, it kind of also leaves us in a certain danger. Because it's important for you to understand what it is. So that you take it with clear understanding, with a clear knowledge. And therefore you experience the f effects and the benefit of it. So I'm going to teach on it. There are many persons watching who have never even partake of it. I believe we have persons in this room also that you have never partake of it. You're new to it. So I want you to get an understanding before we partake of it. Amen? I think that's it where announcement is concerned for today. I want to not delay anymore, just go straight into the teachings and unpack the mystery of what the Spirit would have us to hear and come into today. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 7. I'm looking to see if we have any visitor. I don't see any. I don't think with this kind of weather we would have any visitor. <laughs> we do? You serious? Who is that brave? Where? <laughs> I'm not seeing the person. Oh! That face looks familiar. <laughs> it's your son. So it's a brother. Has been here before? 
Oh, good to have you again. Not at this location, but... Okay, good to have you again, sir. Bless you. Your name? Robert. Hmm. You know that Bobby is supposed to be Robert, but I'm Ralph. So sometimes when people hear my name, Bobby, they say, are you Robert? I said, nope. He's a Bobby? Oh, he's just Robert. <laughs> um, yeah, Bob Marley is Robert, you know, Robert Lester Marley, like Bob Marley. Um, there's a minister of um, a, a government minister in Jamaica. Um, he's um, Bobby Pickersgill. His, his proper name is Robert Pickersgill. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know how it come in, but that's how it is. Anyway, I want us to really stop and think about what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in regards to this teaching. As we are called by God to live life in his kingdom, if you look at this example here on the board, God purposed himself before time began. Remember I, I spoke to you earlier on and I said, we have got to get reason out of the way. Reason is limited to this world. Reason was meant to allow us to function where certain things is concerned in this world, but you have got to learn how to balance it and know where reason is necessary and where it is not. You need to know where reason is illegal. Paul says, I know of a man about 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. He says, such a man entered into the third heaven. And he said, there were languages that were spoken that is unlawful to utter in human language. You need to know where reason is illegal and do not allow it to come in. Right? God existed before time. God existed before time. There was nowhere. God doesn't need anywhere to exist. So God existed before time. And when God existed before time, God purposed himself to be father. People, the Bible that is made up of two covenants, Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament contains 39 books. The New Testament contains 27 books. All 66 books reveal to us that God in his dealings with man, the first man that was created called Adam, because Adam means man, mankind, right? God created him to father him. So when he sinned against God, he sinned against God as father. So it's a son abandoning a father. That's why the spirit that is called the spirit of orphan, the orphan, exists in the entire world around us. Before we got born again, we were heavily influenced by that spirit. And one of the sad things is that many of us, even though we say we're born again, we continue to be plagued by that spirit. Because we are not getting proper teaching, some of us, where we're coming from. And even though you're here, you're still resisting this because of reasoning. Now, God purposed himself to be father. Then God also purposed himself to be king. The kingship speaks of his rule, speaks of authority. This is where God displays power. This authority and power is meant to protect this. And truth is important to the whole order of God being father. Because there is an enemy. Satan, Satan is the enemy of God. And remember, the scripture said that he is the father of lies. So truth is important to God. Truth is important to God. Because the enemy that is against God is a liar, is the father of lies, and he uses lies to oppose what is truth. And how we overcome the lie is that when we know that the truth is greater than the lie, truth is stronger than the lie. You know what I've experienced? I have experienced people lying to me over the years, people you know, doing things even against me and lying where it is concerned. It didn't start in Canada. 
It didn't start with Kem. It didn't start in the ministry. It started in Jamaica. They were lying on me before I even God knew that God would use me as a pastor. They were lying on me before I knew that I would ever function in anything. The present denomination that I was, there, there were things that was fabricated against me. And at one point, I got to the point where I didn't want to go out to be a part of the worship. I stayed away for a while. And then I realized that I wasn't hurting them. I was hurting myself. And when you have truth on your side, you never run away from the lie. And you don't need to defend yourself either when you're in possession of truth. Truth defends you. Truth defends you. It may take a while, but the truth is going to come out. And one of the things that I saw is that the enemy work in a way where things that is fabricated against you, it look close to the truth. Even what has happened to me here, it looks so close to the truth that many people believe it and left the ministry. People believe that I took church money and buy my house because the story was fabricated and put out there. And when we don't know truth, you, you, you see, even this morning I was thinking about it. When I say to you that you need to ask God to show you who I am, it's important. It's important for children to know their parents. Let me say this again. It's important for children to know their parents and also be able to trust their parents. Because when you go out there in that world, there's a whole lot of stuff that is going to come against you. But at least you know that there is a safe haven. Why do you think the Spirit is saying to you, through me, ask the Spirit to show you who I am? Because things are going to come in your hearing. A couple of Sundays ago, a brother that hasn't been here for over two years, and he said, Pastor, I miss this. He said, he said watching from home, it's, it's, you're, you're hearing the word, yes. But he said, being in the moment, nothing can substitute for that. And he said, Pastor, being out there and I hear, he said, I hear so much things about you and he said if you don't know God it destroy you why is the devil so relentless where I am concerned you notice me where me is concerned why notice how who we might come after the one that God sent as a mouthpiece he could have sent anybody else but come on fit, accept the truth and me he sent so what he wants to do, the one that is feeding you with truth, he wants to contaminate. <laughs> He's come against my integrity, come against my character, defaming my character. Let us put together. Every day let our right about me. Even to the government. Who am I, sir? Bobby Somers, born in a 14, a family of 14. Rejected by my mother at eight years. Left with a father that didn't care. Who am I? Why is the devil? Why do I become so important to the devil? That he's, he's, he's relentless to get rid of me. Because he tried to literally kill me, you know? And more than one occasion, but he realized that he can't take me out. Because Christ, you, you see, you, as, believe, believe you me, if I was a nasty pastor, a nasty preacher, Satan wouldn't do what he's doing. The persecution would not be real. You see the genuine? You see the genuine? The genuine. <laughs> I want to see the real you. I don't want to see the copy. I don't want to see the copy. I hope you didn't send the copy of you here today. <laughs> I want the genuine. The Canadian Eye Commission, the, the United States Embassy, 
when you're putting in your application, they said on the application that you are allowed to send in a copy of certain um, documents that they require of you. But on the day of your interview, you must come in with the original. <laughs> you must come in with the original. <laughs> God, I, I want, I, before I read, I want to show you something that I put on the board. And I've made mention of it. I've never put it in front of you before, and I did. Anybody see this? Anybody see this? And I know your reasoning is going to jump ahead. So I put a scripture there for calm down your reasoning. In Revelation chapter 13, Revelation is... It re reveals to us the end of the age. Now may I say this to anybody that is watching or anybody in this room. It doesn't matter if you believe or not. It's happening. You notice how time brings us to a place where we got to this juncture in time where certain things begin to happen and then it just starts to happen at a rapid pace that even the government can't handle. They, make, they keep on making plans after plans and doing all kinds of stuff, and things just, just going much faster than they're able to ever even do anything about it, and they can't. There are things that is happening in the world right now that it doesn't matter, the G20, the G7, and the G whatever they're having, the gathering of the seven, the gathering of the 20, it cannot fix anything because it's God's doing. This world as we know it must come to an end. And it is. That's why there are so many things happening even in the weather pattern. The meteorologists are only telling you. They're only reporting what God is doing. But they can't change it. The thermometer reports what the thermostat sets but he cannot change anything. It measured the, the temperature, but he can't change it. For you to change it, you have to go to the thermostat. God is the thermostat in this order. In the world, there's a whole, and, and the rich people and the billionaires, they're, they're trying to, to see which other planet that's why they're testing out Mars. You notice, you notice the, 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 the frequency of rockets going up and doing, they're testing out Mars. They're testing this. They're saying, how can we escape? Because planet Earth is folding up. And for us, we are idiots. Church people are fools. Preachers are foolish. Bible is, 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 is irrelevant. But does it matter? Look around you. Things are happening. And it's happening on a pace that, as I said, governments are reeling. And for us as the people of God, we should be at peace. Not necessarily at ease, but at peace knowing that we are a part of God's eternal plans and purposes being unfolded moment by moment and day by day. Because you and I could have been born in another generation, but it couldn't happen. You notice the scripture says, Jesus Christ came at a point when 14 generations from Abraham to David... 14 generation from David to the carrying away to the captivity. Why do you think the, the Holy Spirit is, is writing that? It's not a mistake. It's for you to see how God is direct. God is specific. There's no accidents or coincidence in God. And 14 generation from the carrying away to the captivity to the Christ. So he had to come in that generation. <laughs> you and I are born in a generation that God Write it down. So even when you wish that you were born in Elijah time, 
keep on wishing and let it go and accept that this is the generation that you're supposed to be in. And therefore, the grace, the authority, the power, the anointing, and the workings of the Spirit that is necessary as it was for Abraham, as it was for David, as it was for Christ, it is also necessary for Bobby Summers. I'm going to bust the devil head. Satan, you better come out of me way because I'm coming like a train without a break. Satan cannot even touch me with self-pity. He cannot touch me with depression. I am purposeful. Look at how Satan is coming at me. He knows that fornication, adultery, nothing. Sin, as I said. I understand why I'm in Christ. He's not even using anything that is sin to come at me. So he's fabricating stories. And it looks like the truth. And some of you even in this room, your mind is still not free of the cobwebs. Even though you're coming around me, God help you. When I just got born again, I didn't understand. I said, oh, you know, I, I wish I was in Abraham time. And, and we, we tend to give up ourselves and what we're supposed to experience and keep keep. Comparing ourselves to the people of the scripture. When we read the scripture carefully, Peter says that even the prophets of old, when they prophesied and look into the things that was coming to us in Christ, they desire, even angels were peeping over into it and want to be a part of it. But it was not for them, but it was for us. They all died in faith, believing, not receiving the promise because God would not have it for them to be completed without us. I'm not afraid of being in this generation. I'm not afraid of being alive now. The greatest time to be alive on the earth is now. Glory to God. We are a generation that is seeing a lot of things being fulfilled that the prophets thousands of years prophesied. And they, their mind could not even wrap around it. Because nothing close enough exists for them to even use it as a reference. But you know what? They believe God. And they spoke what God wanted them to speak. You and I were in it. And look at us, we're playing. As the scripture said, the children rise up to play and heat. Romans, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. Those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. They will have no lot nor part with God. But it said those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then it says the Lamb who was slain from the foundation or before the foundation of the world. The slaying of the Lamb established a covenant. How do we know it? When Jesus Christ came in time, that's why we observe the Lord's Supper. When he came in time, we know that the covenant that was established, there was a covenant that was established when his blood was shed, when his body was broken. That was not the first time that his blood was shed. That is not the first time his body was broken. It happened pre-creation. So the creation was created out of a covenant. Man was created out of a covenant. Everything that exists where God is concerned is existing out of a covenant. This needs to be established. 
that we stop playing and think that Satan can just come and put sickness on me and get away with it. Do you know how many things we have heard about healing from the time that we were conceived in our mother's womb? Things have been said. Actions have been taken. We're born, and when we're born, we're born in family where we are all kind of talk, grandfather. And, and you know when you can hear some foolishness is when you have family dinner. Some of the foolishness is Christmas dinner. That's why I'm glad I'm not a part of that garbage anymore. Some nonsense with a big belly uncle. Where you know, see for how many years, while in the day, a tear turkey leg. Why may I tell you no? And I'm, and I'm, and, and a lot of people, you always have that person in the family where everybody kind of afraid and things say, anything them say are true, a gospel. And that was sown in your mind. Why is it that many of us are, are sick and we struggle to come into healing? While you, even as I start this teaching, you know, a lot of you run off, or, 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 or condemn yourself, or, oh, I need to this and that. Stop, I warned you, I said stop. Because I'm saying things that you have never heard before. Don't jump ahead and think you know it. Let the word take room. Let the sledgehammer of the word tear down some stronghold that have been built by ungodly uncles and grandmas and, 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 and church going granny would never know God. But they think that because they're going to church, they have an authority on the scripture. How some are we? Oh, my grandmother know the Bible. Know what Bible? You think because somebody quoting scripture, they know it? Does Satan know the word? Yes. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Satan doesn't know it. He knows what is written. He doesn't know the mystery within it. That's why it's a mystery. That's why it's a mystery. And why you think it's a mystery? Because God is hiding it from Satan. If the prince of this world had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, the prince of glory. Satan doesn't know it. So many of us are deceived to think that because somebody quoting scripture, they know Bible. We have a lot of quoting scripture preachers on YouTube and Sunday morning television and all over the place. And we, hey, and we have followed them and said, oh, that guy can preach. Oh, Satan can preach. Look for the fruit. When you know the word, it produces a certain fruit in your life. Jesus said, when anyone hear the word of the kingdom... And does not understand it. <laughs> then the devil come and take it away immediately. He said there are those who hear the word. And for joy. They run off. But as soon as persecution arises. <laughs> they wither away. Because you need to know this. That when you give yourself to God and his word. You will be persecuted. So I am happy about what is going on against me in Canada. I am not happy for the people that join with Satan to do it because it's not going to end well for them if they don't repent. But I'm happy that I'm being persecuted. Yes, Paul said, I gladly glorify God in my infirmity. <laughs> I welcome the kitchen sink being thrown at me. Because it's a clear evidence that Satan has no more hold on my life. He is coming, but he has nothing in me. He's coming at me. He's coming at me. He's coming at me. He's coming at me, but he has nothing in me. So many things have been said, we have seen, we have heard, and we have experienced so many things that blacks our mind. So I put this in front of you, and many of you, not open your, opening yourself, some of you don't even know how to do it. Opening yourself to the Spirit for the Spirit to really establish a certain truth that was never established before. Stop, let reason take you. Where God is not. You know that there are people who convince themselves that they have faith, right? 
But what faith do you have? Because all of these things that we're convincing ourselves that we have, when it's connected to God, there is a certain fruit. Because there is no, there is no doubt that faith works. None, absolutely none. And there is evidence after evidence in the scripture that, the, that God by his spirit devoted an entire chapter, an entire chapter of people that walk in that certain kind of faith, that we have them as a weakness. And the Bible said they become a cloud of weakness. They are calling out to us every day and saying, don't you give up. Don't you believe that lie. Resist the devil. Resist sin because you can do it. Look at us. By faith, the elders have obtained a good report. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah, when he was warned of God, built an ark, never seen rain before, never experienced rain before, but he believed God. And he was moved by faith to build it. And he accomplished the benefit of faith. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Sarah, when she was old. And doctors told her that it's over, it's finished. But by faith, she received strength. And bear children. By faith, women receive their dead to life again. By faith, they quench the violence of fire. Shut the mouths of lion. Oh my God, they overcome. Do you realize that every single one of the nations that come up against Israel, they always outnumber them? But God... We have a track. The only way we don't come into this faith, we don't believe what we're reading, which I know a lot of you don't. Your life tells on you. They had unshakable faith in the living God. And they all died in faith. Not receiving the promise. But they died knowing and believing that the promise of the Christ was going to happen. God, even some of them that died in faith, God specifically said certain things to them. Such as Abraham, that in your seed, in your seed, in your seed, seed as in singular, not seeds. But seed, and the scripture said to us, not seeds as in many, but seed as in one, which was directly referring to Christ coming down through his loins. So the one promised son testified to that. Not Ishmael. Ishmael is of the bond woman. Isaac is of the, the promised child. Uh, <laughs> that one seed... This is not supposed to remain a mystery to the church, but it is. There are some preachers, you will not even hear this come out of their mouth. Because their reasoning will not permit them to. You know why some preachers don't preach certain things? They are not called by God and they don't have the spirit of God. They are operating out of reasoning. So therefore, they see themselves and their purpose of being is to entertain you. It's to entertain you. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to get you even upset. I am here to trouble you. If I'm not troubling you, 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 I'm, I'm, you're not hearing me. Every time you come in front of me, you're supposed to feel like you're not born again yet. Because you're supposed to, you're supposed to question and say, do I really get this? Did I really understand this? And, and, and if that's not happening, you, you, you're deceiving yourself.
You're never supposed to think that you have arrived. Even when you arrive, you don't think that you have arrived. You remain hungry and thirsty. And Jesus said, the way in which you keep the truth that I give to you is by remaining hungry. Like you don't have anything. Like you have never eaten. And Jesus said, the one who desire more... More will be given. And the one who thinks that they have already arrived, what you have will be taken away from you. That's the mystery of the kingdom. It's an upside down kingdom. You're full, but you're hungry. <laughs> you're strong, but you're weak. Glory to God. Because in order for you to carry all of who Christ is, you can never come to the place to think that I have it all. No, you've got to keep on pressing in. You've got to keep on seeking. You've got to keep on knocking. You've got to keep on asking. Reasoning say, oh, you're okay. I have enough. And physically, your tummy gets full. But spiritually, it never gets full. Never. The hungering and the thirsting is not a physical thing. But you can identify with what is physical to, to, to properly understand what it is to thirst. And what it is to be hungry. David said... In the book of Psalms, he, he, David being a shepherd, and, and before he even became a full shepherd, he was sent by his father being the younger. The others, they are in the army, so they don't have any time to take care of the sheep. So he's the younger one, and he was the one that was sent to take care of the sheep. David knew by that time that when the time during the drought time, water is very scarce, Water is important for the existence of the animal, including even the sheep. And he watched the deer, that if the deer doesn't get water during the time of drought, they become vulnerable. And he watched the deer pants for water and know how important. And so David used that now to equate himself to it. And he says, as the deer pants, Searching for water. Even so my soul. Long for you God. I search for you. I long to be where you are. Because the day. You stop thirsting for God. You're dead. Satan has tricked a lot of people around me. I've seen it time and time again. And I watch many of them die a spiritual death. They're still going to church because they leave here and they're in the choir now, you know. And they're leading praise and worship, you see. And they're playing music, you see. And they're preaching, but they're dead. Matthew chapter 7, there's so much to be said here that we don't have time to deal with it. The healing promises of God. Before I read the scripture, let me say two more things here. One of the things that the often church has been doing is that we think that the scriptures are there to support our needs. That's why we have topical Bibles. You notice how the topics are, sub are, are, are structured? It's for you. So, you know, the promises of God. So we go and we claim promise. And we believe 
that when we go before God claiming a promise, God is obligated to fulfill it because I believe it. And many times all we seek to do is to say, tell ourselves that we believe the promise, but we don't believe God. Therefore, it ends up being futile. Because if I believe the promise and don't believe the God that makes the promise, the promise can never be fulfilled on its own. So you're not called to believe the promise, but to believe, you notice, Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever come to God must believe that he is. And that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. Some of us, we fast. And we pray. And we, you know, we fast for three days. We fast for seven days. We fast for 21 days. And we pray. And we now come before God thinking that you are obligated to me because I did these things. And it never worked because that's not how it is meant to work. That's orphans trying to preserve their next meal. When you're a son, your you understand that your purpose, you only exist for the purpose of your father. You secondly, you understand that you are an heir. That everything that the father is and have belongs to you. So I don't need to do things to manipulate my father to get something from him. If your child thinks like that, <laughs> you're not a parent. You're not a proper parent. And that's why Emmanuel growing up, he, he has to get it soon. That giving him things and he getting things. Don't try to manipulate us to get things. When we give you something, we're giving it to you because you are our child. We are your parents. So you don't need to grow up thinking that you have to do some tricks. To get mommy and daddy to give you stuff. It enter into marriage. That men think that they have to do certain things in order for them, the wife to give them sex. And the wife also uses it as a weapon against the man. That kind of marriage have nothing of Christ and the church in it. That's witchcraft. And we see it in the world. Some men know that if I'm going to get the woman, I give her things. I give her things. I give her things. I give her things. And you get to the point and say, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the woman, why are you touching me? Remember, remember, I give you, I give you. And now the woman now, watch this, look at this. The woman now think that she's obligated to give up because you gave her. And I warn you, sisters, be careful how you receive stuff, even from men who say they are brothers, because the ulterior motive is connected to a lot of these gifts. In the body of Christ, such things should never be. And that's why this aspect of this teaching is so important in this. As we have already established in the scriptures for the past two, three weeks, we have established that God is a covenant-keeping God. He's a covenant, he's a God of covenant, and he's a covenant-keeping God. We have also established, past Sunday, I did a, a, a quick review. I look at all the scriptures that we looked at before and see this. Someone sent me a text, I think, last week and said, Pastor, wow, I didn't know that there were so much things that the Bible have to say about covenant until... You brought it to my attention, and I'm now going through it. And so many, I said, yes, it was there all along. I didn't make it up. I didn't bring it from Jamaica. It was there all along. And it shows you the state of the church, that preachers are simply going about seeking to teach. Because tomorrow, many places have decked out, now you know, expecting a large crowd to turn out. Because it's Christmas Sunday. The offering... 
It's going to be big tomorrow. Oh my, we're missing out on it. <laughs> Should have a, a big Christmas tree over this, all right now, and some things set up, you know, and light flashing. And have the and have the and have the nativity with baby Jesus and, and Joseph and Mary and donkey. <laughs> Foolishness, garbage, religion, robbing God's people of the all that is in Christ. Because every year we bring him back to being a baby. He's a grown man when he hung on the cross. And a grown man that ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. A grown man coming back. This is so important for us to get. So I started looking at it. God's healing covenant. God is a God of covenant. Bam! We started looking at this last week. God is good and only does what is good. What was the scripture that we started out with last week? What was the scripture that we started out with last week? Genesis 1. I'm not going back there, but I want you to keep that in mind. Notice the very beginning of God speaking, calling forth things into existence. At each stage, light, firmament, water dividing, hurt being called forth, animals coming forth, the light, the sun and the moon and the stars... The, the stuff, everything. At each stage, it created a day. Not 24-hour day. In the original language, it said, God, he, Elohim, becoming morning, evening, and morning. He becoming evening and morning. The first evening was not about time. God. <laughs> Morning. Get reason out of the way. And then as we see each of those moments come about, notice God, as if he paused, looked at it, and he said, that is Good. It's in line with who I am. And when he finished everything, bringing everything in order, Genesis 1.31, it says, And God saw everything, say everything, everything. that he had made, that it was good. And not just good, but very. Now, when that word, that, that word is an is, is a adjective. Okay. All right. Because if you couldn't give me answer, I would expel you from the college. <laughs> very good. And when it's added, when it's added to a word, what does it connote? It's an expression of, of, of something that is above the norm. Ve you look very beautiful. I'm saying you're more... <laughs> the food was very salty. <laughs> Holy Father. Now you know that once you taste it the first time, you didn't eat anymore because you, you don't want to walk out of there with a high blood pressure. Or the food was very sweet. It's beyond the normal level of sweet. 
I, I went to such and such a house and the place was very messy. You open the door and shoes here and underwear there and all kind of stuff all over the place. You ever go to some people's place and you're tempted to fix some things? You have to hold yourself until you leave. <laughs> Because that's not what you're used to. And something drawing you. And you're looking at things and something. I say, go fix it. <laughs> because if you do. <laughs> sometimes even on your way out while you're leaving. And then not looking. You, <laughs> um, <yeah, sorry. laughs> you make sure at least one something you touch before you leave. <laughs> to at least send them a message that it, that's how it's supposed to stay. Anyway. God is good and only does what is good. Say that again, please. God is good and only does what is good. Say it again, please. God is good. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. Actually, verse 7. So I'm going to read from verse 7 through to verse 11. Asked and it will, notice it will, not maybe. Asked and it will be given to you. Now this doesn't mean that you just show up and ask. This is coming out of a relationship between a father and a son. Notice and you will see it here. It says ask. And it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open. So what, what should be the result if I ask? What should be the result if I seek? What should be the result if I knock? All right. Notice what God brings this into for you to see what it is structured in. It says, for everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And he who knocks, it will be opened. Verse 9. Or, so notice now where it is seated. It says, or, what man, who is this man? This man is a father. What man is there among you? How do I know that he's a father? If if his son. So once a son shows up in the picture... The man is a father. If his son asks for bread, will he give him a? Notice, notice, notice. He says, he says, he says, or if he asks, if the son asks for a fish, will he give him a? Serpent. Notice, you know, and verse 11 says, if you then, being earthly fathers, being evil by nature, so the very nature of the person has been contaminated by sin. But yet we see, I've seen many times, where a child is sick. And I've heard on more than one occasion where the father or the mother would say, I wish I could take the sickness. You see the baby, you see the child. And any good parent, that's all you think. Any proper parent. When you see a child in a state where they're suffering, you wish you could take that pain, take that whatever it is that is affecting them. That's a good father. And hear what God says. Being evil by nature, yet they wouldn't give stone for bread. They wouldn't give a serpent for fish. He says, watch this now. Watch the next statement. This is where it lies for us. Watch this. He says, being evil, know to give good gifts to their children. Watch the next part now. How much more will your father, remember I told you God purposed himself to be our father. So when, he, when we come to him, he becomes our father and we become his children. He says, how much more will your father, and now look, look at what separates him, which is where? In heaven, not the earthly one. Because the earthly one has evil. They're susceptible to evil. <laughs> and some of them, some of them, 
to a certain degree, they overcome the evil to show a certain goodness to their children. Some of them, the evil overcame them. They raped their own daughters. They abused their children, murdered their own children. And God says, how much more will your heavenly father who is in heaven do what? Do what? Do what? Give good things to those who ask him. And why would I ask God for good things? Because if I don't believe that God is good and only does what is good, I will never ask him for anything good. So in order for me to ask God for good things, I've got to recognize that he is good. Hmm. You have some children, after a certain period, stage in their life, they will say to you, me, I, will, I would never ask my father for anything. Why? I will never ask my mother for anything. Why? They have experienced certain things and they have come to see and understand who that person is. How much more will your father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Declare it again. God is good and only does what is good. Third John. Third John. Third John. Only has one chapter. We're going to look at verse 11. For me to think that God uses sickness to teach me something, I am saying that God is not good. Because I'm going to prove to you in the scripture, while I say it, I'm going to prove to you in the scripture that sickness and disease is not good. Sickness and disease is not good. And I'm going to prove it to you in one of these passages that I'm going to look in establishing this. This is another layer of foundation that we're building while we go forward to look at the healing promises of God. But if we don't have this foundation, the promises will never work for us. God is good and only does what is good. Are we at 3 John? Yes. Verse 11. Read with me, please. Ready? Read. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Why? He who does good is? He who does good is what? He who does good is what? All right. Then the rest of the verse says, but he who does evil has not seen God. So people who even do evil against you and say that they are a brother or a sister in the body, come on. The moment you do evil against me, you disqualify yourself from being a brother. You notice? Cain did not see himself as a brother any longer. So when God asked him for his brother, you remember what his question was? Am I my brother's keeper? Evil is not of God. God is good and only does what is good. So let me read the verse again in your hearing as we move on. Beloved, beloved, do not imitate because it's there, it's, it's around you. You can get carried away by it. But do not imitate it. Do not mimic it. Do not pattern it. Do not go after it. Do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God. So notice... When you are in God and God is in you, you can never do evil. Let me say it over here, sir. 
when you are in God and God is in you and you're of God, you can never do evil. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says, make the tree good and its fruit will be good. Because he said a good tree cannot bring forth, put forth evil fruit. And an evil tree cannot put forth good fruit. We know certain things about some people, yet you're expecting something else. If I'm evil, why would you be expecting anything good from me? And that's why I'm saying, if we're going to, if God says, it says, if you ask, it says, how much more will your father in heaven give good, good, give good things to those who are, if I'm going to ask God for good things, I've got to know that God is good. James chapter one, James chapter one. We've got to cast down the idea that God uses sickness to teach me anything. No, he doesn't. God only uses what is good to teach me something. Because he's a good God. He's a good father. I know that when I, the moment I entered into this teaching, there's a lot of strongholds that I would encounter. Some of us have experienced a cycle of sickness for so long that a whole lot of things has happened to us. We're, we're, we, we, even, we even stop believing for our healing where God is concerned. And we, we're talking all kind of nonsense. Utter nonsense. It doesn't make sense, much less to ever touch faith. One of the things that we need to understand as God's people, when certain things is happening, you need to spend more time in the word, making sure that your faith is in the order that God wants it to be. Making sure that your mindset is where God wants it to be. Not all over the place, watching all kind of stuff, listening to all kind of stuff, in conversation with all kind of people. Because everybody you talk to about healing, I promise you, they have an opinion. You notice when you're going to get married? And people hear about it? Everybody have a marital advice or some kind of a counsel to give you. My dear, let me tell you something. You see, when you get married, this is going to happen. And, this is, and the first month, and the first two months, and the first six, I mean, they have it, they have it worked out. They have the science of marriage. Garbage. One deaconess wife telling me, oh, the first three years of my marriage, what it's going to be like. And I said, sis, with all due respect, where you get that from? I said, show me in the Bible that God says, when a, when a man marry a woman, the first three years of your life is going to be really difficult. Some get to the point where they say, marriage, when they you say, hit me, love you, my friend, but guess what? You, you're going to prison. And if you're gone to prison, who is the prison warder? And all kind of stuff. You've got to learn to shut them down. The uncle is going to come and tell. And notice, a lot of them people, you see, especially, imagine a person who divorced two times. What are they going to tell you about marriage? Imagine your mother who had gone through divorce and men hurting her. What is she going to tell you about marriage? Say, Mama, I love you, but stop talking. Because you're talking out of your emotion, you're talking out of your experience, you're talking out of your earth. The Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a terrible thing. <laughs> He's gone to prison for the rest of his life. No, the Bible says, he who, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Speaking of the marriage, a good thing. The Bible says, marriage is honorable. <laughs> and the bed is undefiled. Come on. The Bible says live joyful with the wife of your youth. And let her breast and only her breast satisfy you. Let water flow out of your fountain alone and only yours. Don't let it flow all about over in the streets. 
the things I read about the Bible is that marriage is supposed to be heaven and earth. But outside of the Bible, people who have gone and didn't do it according to God's way and they experience hell, they want to now tell you what the first three years is going to be like because they experienced the first three years of hell. They think now that it becomes a standard for marriage. Some people are go write book, you know. I do not write, I do not read anybody book about, about marriage. This is the book I read for, the, for my life. Ever so often I go back and look at what the scripture says about it. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Look at Colossians chapter 3. I go back and check the word. Because the one who instituted it, he has put an authority and power in place to support it. And those who believe it will experience the beauty, the glory, and the benefits of it. And show off Christ and the church. When you talk about your wife, you light up like the 4th of July. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. It's supposed to be even greater than that. When the wife talk about her husband, you you come on, you, you must know that there is a beauty, there is a joy, there is a peace. The Son of Solomon is written about a, a man and his wife. And you notice how both of them describe each other? Your teeth, your eyes, the, the, the husband describing the wife, breasts, how we, what the breasts is like and what her legs are like and her eyes. And they're searching for each other. And they go out in the street and say, have you seen my lover? The one who, who here is like this on the oil that flows down and, 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 and the smell, oh my God, of his perfume. His cologne is like this and, this. and they're describing him in such a way that if you pass him, you must be able to tell that's the one. Come on, husbands. When last you read Song of Solomon? <laughs> Before you play Lionel Richie and Kenny G and Luther Von Dross. You need to play Song of Solomon. And know that Christ in you makes that 100% possible. The marriages need healing. So while I'm talking about healing, God using me to talk about the marriage. Oh, they need healing. And I'm not talking about sexual healing. <laughs> <laughs> don't, 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 listen, don't listen to Marvin Gaye now. <laughs> listen to Christ. <laughs> it needs healing. Because we need to know that it's more than sex. It's more than sex. James chapter 1. Are you there? James chapter 1. Pick up at verse 12. Pick up at verse 12. Please, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, pay careful attention to the reading of God's word, the hearing of God's word. Be swift to hear and slow to speak. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Have, have you been watching me? Blessed is the man who endures temptation, endures persecution, endures tribulation, endures. Blessed is the man. Now, this is not the man that is outside of God. Outside of God, there is no blessedness that comes to you when you're persecuted. But in Christ, blessed is the man who endures temptation. Why? For when he has been approved... He will receive the crown of life. Watch this. Which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Love him. Don't let the persecution that you experience be self-inflicted. Let it be because you're in Christ. You love God and you're committed to him. Satan comes at you. You rejoice. Watch it says in verse 13. 
Let no one say when he is tempted, when he's tempted. Now, this is the temptation where you're being seduced to do something that is not in alignment with God, his word, or his spirit. So I said, let no man say when he is seduced to be drawn away from God that I am tempted by God. Because when you think of it, would God tempt you to leave him? Nope. God is always drawing you closer to him. God is always doing things to bring you closer to who he is, bring you to more of who he is. Never away. Right? So if you're being tempted, if you're being seduced, influenced to leave God, it's not God. You should understand. So watch what he says. Let no man say when he's seduced to be to go away from me that I am tempted by God. For God cannot seduce anyone by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Verse 14. But let each one, watch this, let each one, but each one is tempted, is seduced when he is drawn away by what? His own desires and enticed, right? Verse 15, the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit is giving you an understanding here of how you can deal with the lust of your heart, the lust of your soul and overcome it. It says in verse 15, then when desires has conceived, you entertain it to the point that it's conceived. Because in order for it to conceive, you have to have intercourse with it. And so the intercourse is when you entertain it. I can never commit adultery, the act of adultery, unless I had intercourse with the thought of it. And it has to be conceived. Because once you conceived it, now you're pregnant and birthing is the next. So what it says, it says, it says, it says now, giving us an understanding of how we can overcome this and live free. When desires are as conceived, it brings forth what? Birth. Notice, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when you give birth to it and it is fully grown, wow, it brings forth death. So God is allowing you to understand that you can abort the seed before it comes to birth. You never have to get to the point where you conceive it. E e e even when you think about evil itself, <laughs> nothing is random. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't just, you just wake up today and this evil come against you. It is planned. There is, um, in the Bible, God commanded Moses to build six cities. And they were known as cities of refuge. You know what was the main purpose for it? That if a person accidentally kill a person, they would flee to that city. During the life of the high priest, they would be preserved from the, preserved from the avenger of blood. If they leave that city and the avenger sees them, the avenger would kill them and the blood would not be required on the shoulder of the avenger. But remember now God says, if it was not accidental where the person premeditated, they hated the person before and you find that to be true, the person should never flee to the city of refuge. They must be killed immediately. Because they planned it. They planned it. What has happened against me in Kem? It's not an accident. I 
I don't care if you're watching. And many of you, you have become so hardened that you hate me. I pray for you. You better forgive me if you say you're of God. Even if you don't like me, you are commanded to love me. It's not an accident. What happened is not an accident. It was planned meticulously. And then things are me an idiot. You think God now talk to me and I show me things? Even those of you that are there using and you're inside this room right now and you're still connected with them and you're giving them information. Why are you doing that? May I see you? Why? The pay we are get, you, you're selling your soul. And you come and you shout and you're jumping and you, you, you sit in the word. But of course it had to happen. But it, it, it bothers me when I see who give themselves over to it. Somebody had to betray Jesus. And wow, you mean one that he chose? Whew. And from the very day, G Marlon, Jesus is skill. He chose the one who is going to betray him and chose the very one that is going to betray him. From day one, he was a thief and he gave him the money bag. <laughs> Wow. You and I would never knowingly, because notice when you all apply for a job, they do background check on you and you have to produce certain things. And if they found out that you were arrested and went to jail for embezzlement and make you the CFO. <laughs> Would they? No. Uh, uh. no, they're not. And Jesus did a background check on Judas. And he said, you know what? I want you to carry the bag with the money. So when people give to the ministry, because the Bible tells us that there were women, even women who gave to Jesus. Ministry. So when they, you, you will take care of the money. So anytime anything, Jesus would ask him for the money. And while he's carrying the bag, he's pocketing, pocketing. And you think Jesus no know? Why would he do that? Wow. So some people around me and things are me blind. I am seeing. If I am not seeing, I wouldn't be a proper leader. But I give time and chance. I give room. And I believe with all of my heart. Because God has changed me. I believe that you too can be changed. James, the Holy Spirit is saying some things to us. Do not, verse 16 said, do not be deceived. Do not what? Many of us have been deceived about God's healing provision for us. We have been deceived about sickness and disease. We have been deceived. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren, my beloved brethren. Every, watch this now. Notice what the moment he said, be not deceived. What follows that? Every, every... Every, every, so if the gift is evil, you know that it did not come from God. Would God give you an evil husband? Would God give you an evil wife? Notice when Ahab married Jezebel, God didn't give Jezebel to Ahab. Ahab married Jezebel because of a covenant that he established with the king of the Zindonians. You notice Jezebel's father, what his name was? Eth Baal. That's, that was where the Baal gods came from. So Jezebel, Bel, Baal, 
She's connected. So she was the one that imported the Baal gods into Israel. God did not give Jezebel to Ahab. Ahab married to Jezebel because of an unholy covenant. And many of us get into marriages that are unholy. And it becomes an unholy covenant. And then certain things coming out. And you're coming even to me asking me if you pray for him. If you marry Satan, how do I pray for Satan? Lord, save him. <laughs> Satan cannot be saved. This is a very serious thing. You know, ladies, I'm warning you again. Men, I'm warning you again. The person you married, and that's why Satan set up a lot of false partners. A lot of false men and women around us. Because he knows the importance of it. And it can destroy your purpose and your destiny. Every time I hear the story of Samson, it breaks my heart. None had that kind of a strength because it was divinely given to him by God. To use for the purpose of delivering God's people from the Philistines. And every time you notice Salam, uh, Samson get into a fight, it was for himself. He was never doing it for the purpose of Israel. He was defend, either defending himself or doing whatever come against him. To the very end, he said, God, even this once, let my ear grow back again. That I may, watch this, that I may die with my enemies. Woman took him off the path. Ladies, you know I love you, but guess what? You see, without Christ, you are dangerous. You're more dangerous than a bullet. I get shot from a bullet and recover. But some women that are not in Christ, when they're done with you, you end up in the mug. Read Proverbs. Two kind of women Proverbs talk about. The adulterous woman... And the harlot. The adulterous one is the one that is married. And choose to live an immoral life. So you remember the adulterous woman. She met this young man. In the book of Proverbs. And he, she said to the young man. And she spice herself. And she spice her bread. And she come out. And she said to the young man. The young man. The Bible said he's void. He's foolish and void of understanding. And she rubbing jaw. And you so say when woman touch you. That's why you tell sister not touch me. Now play around and sit down and make them touch you. You are alive. Things are going to happen when they touch you. I'm not joking. I'm serious. I am not joking. I have experienced it. And I have to say, listen, sister, don't touch me. Don't touch my knee. Don't touch the... Because sometimes they're, they're, they, 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 they give their hand to the devil and they see. And when a woman touch a man, something happens. Right? So the woman touched him and she said, listen, my husband is gone on a far journey. He packed a bag and he's gone on a far journey. And he will not come back until such and such a time. Come with me. Let us go home and fill ourselves with love. And the Bible said he was led like a, he was foolish. And he went in and the husband came back on a dagger. That kind of a woman, the scripture said, she's a deep pit. And you know what happens when you fall in a deep pit? Woman, I encourage you, pursue Christ. Because if you don't, Satan will use you as a dangerous weapon. Women bring down kingdoms, presidents, prime ministers, supreme court judges, CEO. A fortune five companies. <laughs> Politician running and they set up a woman. If you go against the other opposition candidate and bring them down. They bring down pastors. 
A lot of the pastors, they get the videos like me, but they never show their wife. They get the pictures like me, but they never show their wife. They get the text like me, but they never show their wife. And they stay behind the secret and exchange until eventually meet up all go on. Because now the desire conceive. So we will meet in Niagara at such and such a place, at such and such a time. And in these days and age that we're living in, cameras, you never know who, you, you all see somebody up on them phone like this and you don't know so them a video you. <laughs> yes, you know, yeah, yeah. And then look like them a talk, but them a video you, see? My video a run. And then later on, all of a sudden a video is released. And you can't deny it. Then you come in and pulpit and say, oh well, I'm human. A woman send me a picture, immediately me say, Hon, come here. I say, look on this. You don't let that conceive. Because if it conceive, it's going to bring forth sin. And when you finish rearing sin and it finish changing diaper, it's going to kill you. Sin is a baby that you never want to give birth to. Pictures. I said, come here. I said, look here. I don't know who sent this. I mean, remember one, one, one instant, the person, me show my wife, me say, this was the time when they sent me a friend request and they sent this message. And I remember, I remember one individual start out asking me a Bible question. And then they get to, to the point where they want to say certain parts of me. I said, where are you going with After me and a chicken. If you want parts, you go to Wendy's or... Mary Queen, wait, wait, please, him. Eh? Dairy Queen, Mary, Mary Brown, <laughs> some Mary, <laughs> and you can get drumsticks, you can get the chicken side, you can get breast. I'm not chicken. That you want the parts of me. Only one person is supposed to see parts of me, and it's the woman that God gave me as my wife. Out of order. And think that I would take the bait. And boy, Satan, I set up. And I, w I would not doubt it if it wasn't somebody in the ministry set up that Facebook page. I wouldn't doubt it. They have tested me since I've been here. And teaching and preaching the word. They said, no, he cannot be that real. He cannot be that truth. We're going to test him. And my wife said, delete it and black it. I said, well, that's what I intended to do, but me want you see first. Because when you bring your wife into it, you know, make them come and say. Mm -hmm. A lot of these pa pastors out there will listen to me. Bring your wife into it. When you get the text from the prison worship leader, call your wife attention to it. And wife, call your husband. Call your husband attention to it. And then call a meeting. And bring your wife to the meeting. And say, why did you? You're up there leading praise and worship. And this is what you're thinking about? I promise you. If a lot of these pastors that you hear about. That end up in that state. If they had done that. But there was a loss. There was a loss. There was a hidden loss. And Satan studied them and realized that it's there. And he set the bait. He set the bait. Woman, if you text me now, you better make sure I slip your finger. Slip. Our Siri did a typo. I, I, I believe that, brother, that it can't happen. But me just send out a warning. Because I, when, I remember even at advance when I teach and when the Lord would have me to say, some of you are criticizing, but he, he's this and he's that. The Lord is using me because if I didn't warn some of you from the time that I've been here, you would be tempted. But you were warned. And you know, some of you, you would even think about trying it. Make a mistake and send me one text where you send your boyfriend. So you better make sure you look good. Who is in your contact? 
before you press send. Now iPhone, you have two minutes to take back the message. Two minutes, you know. After two minutes, he gone. Come on, people, we cannot continue to play with sin. We cannot continue to play with sin. And some of you come around a hunt, a fish. Does this look like an Asian store? When you go in a fish area, always strong. This is where you come to get the word of God, not to look woman, not to look man. And some of you need to understand that you wait on God to bring you your wife, bring you your husband. Stop fishing because you have been fishing for a long time now. And notice every time you catch something, how it turn out. Some of you catch shark. You catch barracuda. <laughs> You know what? We need to go home, yeah? Then I can't close the door. <laughs> Stop fishing. Let God, let God bring the fish to you. And he can. And he will. Because when we throw the net out without the guidance of God, we don't know what he's going to pick up. God is too good to give you a evil husband or an evil wife. He will never give you Jezebel. He will never give you Delilah. He gives you Sarah. He gives you Esther. <laughs> he gives you Deborah. He gives you Elizabeth. He gives you Ruth. He gives you Naomi. You notice those persons, those women, these are women that we see become women of God. <sighs> he gives you Rachel. He gives you Anna. <laughs> Rebecca. Mary. Anna. You know, I was showing someone, um, I think it was on Friday or Thursday, that there is, I think, what, five prophetess. So five or six prophetess that the scripture talks about. And there was one false prophetess. You're thinking. <laughs> that they used to come against Nehemiah. But all the others were good. But watch this. I was showing, I was speaking to a female, and I said, do you notice the prophetess in the scripture? They never function without a male counterpart. They either have a husband, a father, that they were connected to. So if you notice, when the scripture mentioned, the first prophetess in the scripture to us was Miriam, and it says, the sister of Aaron. Specifically. Then it talks about the other prophetess, and it tells you that they are either the daughter of such. And then, as I was talking to the person, the person went right away to look at Luke chapter 2. And just said, yes, because even when it mentioned Anna, Anna was married for seven years, and then her husband died. But it mentioned her father, that she was the daughter of this person. And I said, the reason why it mentioned she being the daughter, not the of her, mentioned her husband, because her husband is dead, but the father was still alive. We have women today who take it upon themselves and want to go rogue and it will never end well for you. And I am not against women when I speak. Many of you hate me because I speak the truth of God's word. Pastors hate me because I speak. Do I care? It will never end well. God, from the time that the female engaged the serpent in the garden, and if you notice, scripture after scripture make reference to it. From that time, Satan learned certain things about the female. What did God do? He put an extra layer of protection in place 
for the female. The female that will experience that protection is the female that honors God. So it's, it become a thing now. Do you believe in women, preacher? Why would you be asking someone around me if they believe in women, preacher? Because I speak the truth of the word. God never called a female to preach. Never. And there's a reason why. Because of what he wants to show off. And it must be consistent. It cannot be mixed. It must be consistent. And because we have a slack church that have bowed itself to culture, when you look in the world around us, female has been abused for years. Don't doubt that. I never deny that. Yes, they have been abused. And it got to a point where the females say enough is enough. And they begin to rebel. And it become a movement. Right? And we see it, there's a, it's constant. And even though we have the movement, it's not winning. Because the, 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 the gap between wages is still wide. The treatment is still wide. Name it. So there's a constant cry. Every year when they celebrate International Women's Day. Notice. They said we have come uh, uh, you know, a long way. But there is yet a long way to go. Because this is still happening. And this is still happening. The church now believe. That because that spirit exists in the world. We need to bring it in. And if pastor can preach like that, I can preach too. So Apostle Lana, Bishop Reverend, <laughs> and don't want me to say anything about it. And any husband who know the word and sit down and allow your wife to function in that without saying anything, you are a weak man. You are like Eli and it will not end well for you. You need to put down your foot and bring her to the order of scripture. And if she refuses, divorce her. Because if you don't divorce that rebellious woman, it will destroy you. Once you do what you're supposed to do and they keep on rebelling, they've cut her off. This is not a joke thing. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. <laughs> you know, winter outside, but fire in here. <laughs> Glory to God. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift, every good gift, every good gift, every good gift, and every perfect gift is from where? It's from where? It's from where? And why is it coming from above? And comes down from the? That's why I said earlier on, in order for me to ask God for something that is good, I first have to recognize that he is good. I never forget the day when I was journeying from Port Antonio to go to Ocho Reyes. Those of you who are familiar with Jamaica. So I'm leaving from Portland to go into Ocho Reyes. Going to Ocho Reyes, you pass through St. Mary to go over to that parish. It would take us, before they had done anything to the road, it would have taken you about two, two, two and a half hours. Sometimes three, depends on traffic to get there. There were some of those occasions where I would be traveling alone in the vehicle. Very rare I was ever alone in my car. But there are some occasions that I would be alone. And I can't recall why I was in the car that day by myself going to Ocho Reyes, And I entered into the town of Anatobe and I picked up two young ladies. As a matter of fact, I passed them got to a certain distance and turn around and come back and pick them up. Because that's the next thing too. I don't just pick up people because, you know, they're 
you know, itching a ride. So I went past by, come back around and pick them up. One came and sat in the front, the other one sat in the back, of course. And you know, in Jamaica, you have all two, three persons sit in the front of a vehicle in a taxi, and one of the ladies sit down between the gear stick. <laughs> <laughs> and that's purposely done. Come on. I picked them up. They came in. Good morning. Hi. How are you? I'm good. And for about a hour, I said nothing. And it was quiet. <laughs> the girl turned to me and said, you're Christian. <laughs> I didn't say yes. I, I, I follow my, the example of my leader, Jesus. When you ask Jesus a question, he said, before I answer your question, let me ask you one. So I said, why do you ask me that? She said, from the time you pick, pick, and Jamaican, from the time you pick we up, from the time you pick us up, you said nothing to us. You're a man, handsome man. And pick up two beautiful ladies and don't say anything to them. You must be a Christian. <laughs> so... Eventually, I said, yes. I said, then hear the other one now. What? What a waste. <laughs> Handsome man. <laughs> Handsome man. <laughs> Handsome man like you. Gone to church. Now notice how the devil are working. Huh? Come on. He's playing on me. Delilah. I picked up, I picked up Jezebel and Delilah. <laughs> and the gang upon me. But I refuse to compromise my anointing. And I said, why would you consider it a waste? Why would you consider it a waste? I said, this is the most purposeful thing that a person can do in life. And that is to surrender their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. She said, well, you can stay this way you want to I said, okay. And from that point on, I said, not another word until they got to their destination, and I let them off. And I said, good riddance. And I wanted to prove to people that you can be handsome and heavily anointed. And that's life. That's life. Oh, yeah, it was a test. And many times, over and over, God is good and only does what is good. So let me remind you one more time as we stop at verse 18. Every good gift, say every good gift. Every good gift. And every perfect gift, say every perfect gift. Every perfect gift. Is, from is from above. Is from above. And notice, and it says, it comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. I, 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 Father, I pray that we will get these revelations. I pray, Father. Notice verse 18. It says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of, how were we born again? By the word of truth, that we might be what? A kind of first fruit of his creation. Look at the person beside you if you're born again. I hope you're born again. Look at the person beside you and said, if you're born again, you are of a certain kind of fruit. Yeah, you are. Look at the person again and say this. If you're born again... You're not common. I said, if you're born again, you're not common. So why would you live common? Mm. Pick up a common man. Pick up a common woman. Come on. Go to common places. You're not. I was listening to the scripture. We're going to go to Acts chapter 10. And I stopped there for today. But I was listening to the scripture. And um, it was the part of the scripture that speaks of um, when Saul was pursuing David with about two or 3,000 men. 
wanting to kill David because the spirit of jealousy came upon him and he wanted to kill David, literally kill David. David now was, you know, in between hiding here and there and so forth. And there was a day when David and his men showed up where the priests were and they were hungry. And David asked if there was any food. The priest said, no, there is none. He said, we do not have any common bread. The only bread that is here is the holy bread. Wow. The holy bread. And you know what the holy bread was? The sh bread, the show bread, which was the bread of his presence that they would put into the temple and it would be changed every seven day. Fresh bread had to be brought in. He does priest, remember the priest said to him, if the men have kept themselves and they are sanctified for how many days? He said they are permitted to eat it. David said, yes, we have. We have not come near any woman in how many days, and we have done this and done this. And the priest gave them the holy bread. So it wasn't common bread. And I think of that, and I said, that is speaking of something to us also, that we are a holy nation. We are a holy nation. Many of us fail to understand who we are. I am not a commoner. When, 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 when you live life in a kingdom, <laughs> the kingdom sets you apart. That everything that is touched, it is now sanctified unto the reality and the life of the kingdom. I read Esther and they talk about the royal wine. The royal garden, the royal palace, the royal this, the royal that. And I'm seeing all of this in light of being in the kingdom of God. I cannot live a common life. Out there, they're commoners. And they want you to submit to their order. And if you don't, then they said you are. They say, what, what they say you are? And they're outcast. They might use politically correct word. That you are not this and you're not that. So we find the church now submitting to show them that, oh, we're like you. No, we're not. We are not. Acts chapter 10, verse 34, going down to verse 43. Now I want you to take careful note how healing is directly connected to the presence of God. Healing is directly connected to the presence of God. Healing is directly connected to the presence of God. It kicks me out. I need to find about this because there is something else that I want to show you as I end this. Uh, healing is directly connected to the goodness of God. What did I say? Healing is directly connected to the goodness of God. Got a covenant. Here we go. Acts chapter 10. Verse 34. It's a scripture that some of us are familiar with. But let us look at it in the light of what we're talking about. The goodness of God. God is good and only does what is good. You know the religious statement that is made in church. God is good all the time. Yet we have a lot of sick 
people, people in bondage, all kind of stuff. And God is good. Hallelujah. All the time. All the time. God is good. Religious. Right? Watch this. Some of us know by reading this passage before, the backdrop of this passage. Cornelius had a dream or a vision. He was on fasting. And it was about what? On the third day of his fast, God sent an angel to him. And when the angel appeared to him, the angel told him that God had seen his harm giving, you know, his charitable giving. And his prayer had come up before God as a memorial. So God says, this is what you need to do. There is the Apostle Peter in another town opposite you. Send, you know, and get him and he will tell you what you need to hear when he comes. Why didn't God talk to him? Why did God tell him to send for Peter? Why didn't God just talk to you and leave me alone in Jamaica? There's an, there's an order that some of us keep missing. Order. You see, even in this ministry, I've watched from Jamaica coming here, and I warn people, talk to people, but not everybody listen to me, even though they call me pastor. I see men and women operating out of order. I warn some of you, and I told you this, you never speak to a man's wife without his knowing. Brother Jackson, do not speak to a man's wife. Don't give them any word. I don't care who give you the word. Do not give them any word unless the husband have knowledge of it. As a matter of fact, if the husband is not even present, you don't talk to them. Do not approach them. There's an order. When you do that, not only are you exposing yourself, but you're endangering them if they ever open themselves for you to speak to them. Secondly, these persons are under one leadership in this room. I'm, I'm not going to go around no corner. You either, you, you either submit or leave. There is no two. God never have two leaders at any given time. When Moses was alive, how many leaders did God have? Moses was the leader. The others were there around assisting. Joshua knew that he was there to serve Moses. Today, the pride of our heart. It's destroying us. Nobody wants to support anymore. Everybody wants to lead. One leader in this room. Any of you in this room that get any word for anybody, it must run by me before you release it. I'm warning you because you're damaging a lot of people because not everybody's mature enough to handle even things that you release to them. Later on, you know who it come back to? I've seen marriages being destroyed because of word, prophecy. And if you are not a recognized prophet in this room, you have no right to prophesy to anybody. If you're not a recognized prophetess, you have no right to prophesy to anybody. And I'm not saying that some of you are not prophet or prophet, but you're being matured until you are recognized and released. Hold your peace. There's an order. Order. And Satan loves when you go out of order. Order protects. Order protects us. You know, you, as, as I've said this from time to time, you, you, you own your vehicle. You purchase it. You know, wherever you purchase it from, you pay for it. It's yours. There's an order in how your vehicle functions. So after you buy it, a fimi, nobody can tell you if you do. Put the water in the gas tank. Put the gas in the engine where the oil is supposed to go. Put the gas in there. I beg of you, please, do not switch it on. Because if you switch it on, we're not even going to find you to have a funeral for you. But you've got to follow the order. Put the gas where it... They even have an indicator. Even when you open the engine where you put the, the wind, windshield washer, one big something that you can't miss it. <laughs> it's for your protection. Everything is set up based on an order. And once you follow the order, 
it, it become near impossible for certain things to happen. Because notice, accidents, accidents are not accidents. <laughs> accidents are not accidents. They happen because you're out of order. There is no accidents in God. God providing for you is not an accident. God protecting you is not an accident. You walking in the anointing is not an accident. You being led by the Spirit is not an accident. You hearing the voice of God is not an accident. You hearing me teaching this word today, it's not an accident. So it tells us now, after God gave instruction to Cornelius to send for Peter, that when Peter come, Peter would tell him the things that he needed to hear and come into an understanding of. He did what this angel of the Lord told him. He sent the men to Joppa, and he told them specifically where to go. Go to one Simon, a tanner, and ask for Simon Peter. And this is what they did. So now Peter went with them. Verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth when he came into Cornelius' house. And Cornelius was preparing for him. So he had his family and he had his close relatives and friends in the house with him. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no. God shows no. God shows no. So how is it that racism exists in the church? And we're using scripture to justify it. God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him, God. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Verse 37. That word you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and begun from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God, notice how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? The Holy Spirit and with power. And Jesus went about with that anointing, doing what? Doing, doing what? Good. And what was, the, what was the good? What's connected to the good here? And healing all who were oppressed by the? So sickness and disease is an oppression. Sickness and disease is, a, is an oppression from the yeah. devil. If sickness and disease exist in your body right now, you have oppression in your body. So you watch this. It's giving access to the oppressor. Did you know that when God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, the Bible said there was not one sick among them? Imagine... They being in slavery for 400 years, there would be those who were wounded. There would be those who were sickly because of the, even their health condition, because they're slaves. So they're not treated right. So there were those who were wounded and sick and all kinds of things. But the night when God delivered them out of Egypt, Egypt is a type of the world. Pharaoh is a type of Satan. Slavery is a type of sin. It wound them. But the very night when the blood of the lamb was shed and God passed over and God brought them out, the Bible said there was not one sick among them. There are those who are saying, Allah, we cannot be healed. Why? If you want to stay sick, keep the oppression in your body. Give room to the oppressor. I promise you, he will take advantage of it. Do you know what it is not to have your health? Some of you 
things that you, you, you enjoy. Now you have to look at it and wish it well. Because the moment you put a piece of it at your mouth, Satan said, not today. This kind of a weather, there is something that is known as arthritic. You know, when this weather comes to be like this, that's why a lot of us go home. A lot of us are in Florida now. A lot of us are in Jamaica, Atlanta. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because you have arthritis why you go to Atlanta, right? <laughs> no. You're supposed to be in this country until God says time for you to move. And no arthritic condition, no sickness, no disease. You live healthy. Sickness and disease is an oppression of the devil. You must choose what you don't eat and what you want to eat anytime, anytime. Hear this. Yes. May I stop it? I'm so finish. When I was in Jamaica watching television, Trisha, I noticed in the movies, people at night would get up and go downstairs for milk and cookie or cake and something. And I say, hmm, is that really so? You know, this is a movie thing, man. <laughs> and you know, wish you, well, yeah, Jamaica, you got your bed and then finish cuckoo much hours at night and whatever. The, you, you go to your bed, you don't think about no food because there is none. Right? Everything finished over. And now, I'm in Canada. It doesn't happen often. But there are those moments when I find myself downstairs. <laughs> and there are times when I do milk. There are times when I do other things. I'll have a banana and a piece of bulla cake. Or banana. A couple nights ago, I had banana and um, old grain bread. Ripe banana and the bread. And come back up and go to my bed. Go back to bed. Nothing no wrong. I don't have no upset stomach. I don't have no burning stomach. So I can eat banana any hours of night. What say you? No, pastor. If I eat banana that hours a night, I can't lay down back and sleep. It's going to ride me. <laughs> it's it's going to ride, ride my chest. Let the banana know that you're not a donkey or you're not a horse. Right? I don't, I don't do tea, so... My wife would do tea sometimes, but I don't do tea, so I go down, I do milk, I do some kind of a drink, you know, whether it's maybe pineapple drink or something like that, and go back up on my bed and lay down and sleep. So now I'm, I'm, I'm living out what I saw in the movie. I'm, I'm serious. As God's people... We're not supposed to be oppressed by Egypt any longer because we have been delivered from Egypt. Pharaoh has been killed and you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. We're not supposed to be lactose intolerant. If you don't drink milk or eat ice cream, it must be your choosing, not because something is oppressing your body. Lactose intolerant. When we were growing up in Jamaica, we didn't hear about these things. I never hear about no notology until I came here we eat the nut and the trash that come in I we did not come with we used to get the milk this the bring the fresh milk from the cow they scarlet. it we put sugar and nothing make drink it sometimes we all drink the raw milk lactose intolerance when I hear lactose I say what's that what is that not allergy Food allergy. <laughs> and it filled the church. It should be something out there in the world, but not in our, where we are concerned. Let me read this again. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good, healing, healing, healing. Say all, healing. So all that is in this room, all that is watching, if you're sick, you can be healed right now. It's the same God. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hebrews 13 verse 8. 
And notice, he healed all who were oppressed by the devil. Why? For the good God, the good God was with him. And he says, and we are witnesses of all these things which he, Christ, did. Both healing the sick and raising the dead and all of that. Both in the land of the Jews and in, the, in Jerusalem. Whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up for on the third day and showed him openly. Verse 41. Not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God. Even to us, the apostles, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Verse 42. And he, and he commanded us to do what? To preach to the people and to testify that he is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and of the dead. Verse 43, and I stop. To him, Christ, all the prophets witnessed that through his name, whoever believes, whoever believes, whoever believes in him, will receive remission of sins. Remission of sins. Look at the word. As I said this morning when I was sharing at the beginning before we pray. Many don't believe that we can live A uh, sin free life. Nope, this is impossible, right? Isn't it? So you think I'm a sinner? You think that I'm pretending I'm not what I am? You know, so I come and say one thing and then behind your back I live another life? <laughs> Every day. That's what I was told at the beginning. That you have to pray every day about sin. So you, you, you confess all sin that you know commit. Lord I'm a fornicator. I'm an adulterer. Lord I'm a thief. Now if I hear you praying and say you're a thief. I'm going to call the police. Because <laughs> we have a criminal among us. I'm a thief, I'm a this, I'm a that. Because we think that if I, if I put myself in these things, then God is going to pity me. Through his name, the remission, notice remission of sin would be preached. Remission. What does that mean? Re. Is to remove, is to reverse. Mission. So if you have remission, then whatever act of sin that was being carried out because of the forced, because you have sin and then you have the scripture talk about sins, right? I, I put it here. There is the sin. And there is sins. This is the nature of it. This is the act or the actions of it. The scripture says, For he, you, she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their John said, Behold the Lamb of God which take away the sins of the world. So Jesus dealt with both. If the nature of sin is canceled, you know what? The action is also canceled. Because if the nature is not there anymore, you have no desire to do it. it the act can never be carried out. So when Jesus died on the cross... He dealt with both. He was wounded for our transgressions. 
he was wounded for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes, whoever believes, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Remission of sins. Remission of sins. You hear this term medically. You go to the doctor and they said, you have cancer. They put you through a treatment and they said, the, si the cancer is in. What does that mean? The cancer is in remission. So if you hear they say, when they say the cancer is in remission, you shouldn't walk out there a ball. What they're saying to you that there is a reverse. Instead of it growing, instead of it advancing, it's reversing. That's good news. Jesus Christ came to take away the sin and the sins of the world. If you believe, notice now, whoever believes in his name. Once I believe in Christ, sin is no longer an issue. I'm not asking you, I am telling you, and a lot of you in front of me, if you refuse to change your life, change your ways, you will be dealt with severely by God. Because you do not only have a preacher telling you to do something, but he's an example in front of you. I used to think that I have to pray every day and confess sin, and then I got to the point of understanding this. If I didn't commit any sin... I don't need to repent of it. And the Holy Spirit is there to guide you into all truth. At any given time that you have done something wrong, he convicts you. He speaks to you. You repent, you move on. If we don't believe that we're free from sin, then that's why sickness Sickness and disease continue to be a big factor in our lives because sickness and disease is directly connected to sin. And if he take away the sin and sins of the world, he would also have to take away sickness and disease. God bless you. Healing is from a good papa, a good padre, a good daddy. I said padre and she smiled. <laughs> I'm speaking her language. <laughs> Healing is from a good father. And we must only expect what is good. Only expect what is good. Because God is good and only does what is good. Ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. On the 24th day of December 2022, it's time for sickness and disease to be eradicated from the church, from the body of Christ. We must give up all the lies and the deception, the false, the, 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 the fallacy that has crept into the church and we have denomination that is against the, who God is and what God put in place and we believe it. Nothing but the truth and only the truth will make us free. Free from sickness and free from disease. If I live in fear, that I can be sick, then I will be sick. I believe that Jesus Christ took my sins and equally he also took my sickness and diseased when he nailed, when he was nailed to the cross and he destroyed it. So it's no longer, it, when, when I come to be in the kingdom of God, 
in this world, sickness and disease doesn't exist. It's a non-existent thing. A non-existent thing. And if it doesn't exist, why should I be afraid of it? Think about it. Stand with me, please. By the way, um, did anything change? Baby's here. Good day, sir. I'm assuming that you are the father. Okay. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. I hope you believe it. But even if you don't, this is what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything that you think or you feel. I'm doing exactly what the scripture said. Jesus himself did it. It was done to Jesus, for Jesus. And then later on, he came into the place where he was doing it. It says, then little children were brought to him, Jesus, that he might put his hands, hands. It's very powerful. And we in the body of Christ should understand that laying on of hands is not something simple. It's not just something natural. People in the world knows it too. Did you know that? That's why some people on purpose want to touch you in your head. On purpose they want to touch you certain parts of your body. On purpose, some people want to touch your children. And you have to recognize this and say, no, 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 don't, don't touch my baby there. Don't touch my baby. As a matter of fact, don't touch my baby any at all. When hands is laid, whether it's a person of God or a person of Satan, spirits can be transferred. And it does happen time and time again. Right? So when Jesus put his hands on them, what would have happened? Hear what it says. It says that he would put his hands on them, and pray, but disciples. And so when he prayed, based on how he prayed or what he prayed, would transfer what the laying on of the hands now give a conduit to. Right? It says, but the disciples rebuke the parents, stopping them from coming. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And notice again, verse 15, and he laid his hands on them and departed from there. He always asks this, do you know me? Never met me. So how you end up here today? She tied you up and put you in the trunk of the car and brought you here. <laughs> Have you ever met me? Once before. What do you know about me? When you see me or you hear about me or you think about me, what comes to your mind? That one thing that comes to your mind, what comes to your mind? You're not sure? Oh, wow. That's not good. So... 
what I'm doing here, it's, mace, it's, it's mainly based on the fact that I know your mother. Right? Because when you're going to have someone blessing your baby, you don't bring them to a Catholic priest that you don't even know and then put holy demonic water in them. A Roman Catholic priest. You should know who is going to lay hands on your child. Because after today, some serious things can either happen or some blissful, wonderful things can happen for your child. But whose hands are you entrusting them to, to bless them? The mothers knew that Jesus was a certain kind of person. That's why they were eagerly wanting to bring their children and disciples stopping it. Because they know that if Jesus touch my child, if Jesus touch my child, my child life, the possibility is that my child life can completely be transformed for the rest of their life. Their destiny altered, purpose affected. If they're sick, they would be healed. So, your mother know me. So have coffee with her and ask her who I am. You talk to her? Yeah? Give me her name, full name. Jalaya Tasha, Tasha. Tasha Wilson. She's sleeping. Ooh. Let us pray. Father, this is not a joke for me. This is not something that I take lightly. It's important. It's serious. So, Father, as I hold this child in my hands, I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that I have to bless this child, knowing that when a child is born, even before the child is born, from in the womb, the child is exposed to two worlds, light and darkness. Father, you are the greater. You are the one who have a plan and a purpose for this life. This life did not come in by accident. And Father, while this life comes in, there is another world that wants to imprison this child's life, wants to bring tremendous harm to this child's life. But today, as I take this child into my hands, I am decreeing and declaring that there is an alteration. There is a divine shift that is now taking place where this child is concerned. I decree and declare that this child will preserve, be preserved from sickness, from diseased diseases, Father, from different types of demonic influence and activities that is in the world around us, that wanting to come at this child to bring harm to this child's life. Father, I decree and declare a divine preservation. I ask, Father, that with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, this child will be marked. This child will be marked. This child will be sealed. And Father, the plan and the purpose that you have brought this child in, I pray that the parents will come to see it. They'll come to understand it. That they will be able to also be a part of nurturing the child in that order. Father, I pray that you'll bring the people that are a part of the child purpose to cross path early in this child's life. They will cross path with the child. The child will cross path with them. As you did for Samuel. As you did for, for Josiah, as you did for Esther with Mordecai, when Esther's parents died, you allow Mordecai to cross path with her. And Mordecai took her and reared her as his own daughter. And Father, we saw how that destiny played out. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that the people that are destined, that are purposed to be a part of this child, that they are the one that will cross path with her day by day, moment by moment. Keep every Every person away that is not a part of this child's purpose, that is not a part of this child's destiny, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that this child will never go for lack of clothing, food, shelter, 
proper guidance, proper parenting. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll preserve this child from fire, from water, from demonic influence, and everything that Satan has set up out there. Father, you will dismantle it. And I'm decreeing and declaring that no weapon that is formed against this child shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against this child in judgment, it will be condemned. And Father, I pray that this child will discover her purpose in life early, early, early. Thank you, Father, for granting it. As I asked in the name of your son, I pray that the parents will come to know you. Oh, my God, I pray that they'll come to know you. I pray that they'll come to know you. Father, whatever it is that the enemy is doing right now to blind their eyes, I pray that their eyes will be open and they will see the wonderful God that you are, the good God that you are, and their child will see that example in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for hearing, thank you for answering, and thank you for granting it. In Christ's name I pray and tell you thanks. Amen and amen. As a minister of the gospel, an ambassador within the kingdom of the living God, I decree and, decree and declare over your life that the Lord will bless you. The Lord will lift his countenance upon you, cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you his peace all the days of your life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the precious Holy Spirit. Amen. I decree and declare that you are blessed of the Lord. Generational curse is broken. Cycles are broken. You are blessed of the Lord. Amen. Wow. No picture? Just picture. Then, then you never want a picture of your baby being blessed or dedicated. If you want to do video, it's up to you. So that when she grows up, you said, this is what happened to you. And this day, a very cold day. Oh, yes, it was. But you were in warm hands. <laughs> she gave a smile. That you want to be in it? Trisha, take away phone from him. <laughs> He's saying you guys are good. Come in the picture. Come and stand beside your wife. <laughs> Am I prophesying? Amen. Good, thank you. Bless you, my dear. So good to meet you, even though you're in and out of sleep. All right, go to daddy. Thank you. You're welcome. Bless you. You know to hold her, right? <laughs> <laughs> Bless you. You're welcome. My pleasure. All right, all the best. You're welcome. Bless you. Love you too. 